When the pioneers settled in western Manitoba in the mid-1800s, they brought with them established agricultural methods they'd learned in eastern Canada, the British Isles, and Europe. At first, the settlers were limited to hand farming, using only horses and the simple equipment that could be transported by ox cart. But with the construction of the railway, heavy agricultural machinery began to find its place in Manitoba, and the threshing outfit became the focus of the harvest. The arrival of the steam boilers and threshing machines did not eliminate the need for traditional horsepower. Workhorses like the Belgians and Clydesdales owned by Wes Ferguson of Minnedosa were an integral part of the harvest process. You have to train them. You don't just go and catch something out of the pasture and go and haul stoops. So, yeah, it's been done, but it's pretty inconvenient. <laughs> Most of my horses have been stoop thrashing before. And, uh, oh, I have some here that, that haven't been, but I got lots of horses, so we usually use some of the older horses. And I'll have one three-year-old thrashing this afternoon. Yeah. We try to match them up so they make a pretty decent looking kind of a team. And, and then I have mostly Belgians, I have some Clydes, but, but they can pull quite a load on a pair of wheels. Like once you get out on the hard road, it's not so heavy, but it, it digs in pretty good in the, in the stubble. You need a pretty reasonably husky team. There's four steel wheel wagons here. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. The rest are rubber. With modern combines, the grain is picked up and cleaned in one step. In the days of threshing, the grain was first cut with the binder. Weather hazards made it poor practice to leave the sheaves laying in windrows for any length of time, so as soon as possible, workers would lift six or seven sheaves to form a stoop. Keeping the grain off the ground helped to preserve the grain, but the early farmers still suffered if the harvest dragged on too late. Well, they had trouble too, like if the snow got on it, then you had to dig them out of the snow and sometimes use the sleigh, and mm -hmm. it, uh, it sure was a lot better to have it done before it come to that. They, a lot of the time years ago, when they didn't have enough uh, thrashing machines to go around, the one man would own a thrashing machine, and then he'd thrash for several of the neighbors, and they used to stack them then, and then thrash them out of the stack so that they didn't run into the snow problem. Like Wes Ferguson, Frank May of Brookdale remembers the days when the steam outfits were used to serve an entire district. In the first place there were about three steam outfits in each district. There wasn't one and everybody didn't have one and there wasn't power and there wasn't manpower enough to work all those. Straw got scarce and people got worrying about, about the straw being fed up and, and help was getting scarce to run the steam outfits. And, so people started getting individual thrashing machines. Maybe two farmers would go together, sometimes just themselves. And they'd get a little gasoline outfit and they'd go out with two teams and get two loads and thrash them and get two more loads and thrash them. And this did away with the thrashing run. Maybe we're going to have wet weather. And once the wet weather comes, then the grain isn't as good after. Mm -hmm. And if they could get even a little bit down dry, Otherwise, they had to take their turn, and some the one that would be first this year would be last in the run next year. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the grain was quite tough, and there was no grain dryers, and, mm -hmm. and so everybody wanted to get some of that first grain. And so they, I don't think the the gas engine wasn't wasn't as efficient as the steam. Mm -hmm. A threshing crew had only one engineer. In a pinch, a fireman could operate the engine for a day or two because he always worked hand in hand with the engineer at the core of the outfit. In some areas, young boys served as straw monkeys, scampering back and forth between the stack and the firebox with straw to fuel the outfit. In other areas, wood and even coal was available, so a team of horses was assigned to the fuel chores and usually one man was responsible for the water team. The boiler crew and the separator crew worked together to get the boiler fired up and the belt aligned to the separator, which was usually about 50 yards from the boiler. 
Until the separator was running, the rack drivers sat patiently waiting with their first load of sheaves. Once the outfit was operating, the pitchers and baggers and grain wagon drivers were all set to work. The drivers began their countless trips to the field for more sheaves, and of course there were field pitchers on the ground, loading the wagons. Counting the women who often brought meals to the fields, a threshing outfit needed a crew of about 20 workers. Well, the hours varied according to the temperament of the farmer. Some thrashed from 6 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock at night. My father thrashed from 7 till 7. He said that's about all the men could stand. Uh, people keep asking me, did I run a steam engine? And no, I didn't. I was delegated to run the stook loader, and I stayed on there. I was a good stook loader man, apparently, and they kept me doing that. Well, I was raised, as you might say, on the step of a steam engine. I was fascinated by them when I was little. And I used to go out to the field when my father was thrashing, and I'd go out at 6 o'clock and sit there on the, on the seat and wait for an hour and sometimes more while they cleaned up so I could get a chance to shove the throttle shut. And when I was about, uh, about 12, I guess, I was a little runt when I was young. And uh, we wanted to move to another farm we had a couple of miles north. And my father was giving the uh, fireman instructions and he said, who's going to Who's going to run the engine? He said, he is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I did it all right. Mm -hmm. And he said to the fireman, you do what he tells you. <laughs> George Down is an active volunteer at the Agricultural Museum in Austin. He comes from Holland, Manitoba, and remembers the time when his family used steam to thresh. He also remembers when the gas engines began to replace the steam. They had two steam outfits and then they quit them on account of bad water and went to gas. You know, they had trouble with flues leaking and one thing or another and had to go too far for water. And if you have to go too far, you've either got to have bigger tanks and more horses on them. So they decided they were offered a pretty good thing for the steam engine on a gas engine, so they traded it off and got gas. Uh, one thing that cut these things out quick we had two wars in Canada, well, you know, the World War I and World War II. World War I was really the one that trimmed the steam engines down because there was no, no men. So they were going to small gas outfits and just doing their own, mainly. It was the odd one kept on down our country. We had uh, two or three steam outfits run until the early 40s. But other than that, they were all gone. The scrap men. Uh, smashed into pieces as fast as they could. They'd buy them for $35, and I they got about 200 for the iron out of them. And they'd come into the district and find a, a steam engine, and that would give them a start for a car load, and they'd smash up the steam engine, and, and then they'd get, gather old binder parts and stuff and make up a car load of scrap. And uh, that's why I gathered all these things, so the scrap man couldn't get them. The scrap dealers would go around, and they would they would say that the government had said that they were to any any iron over 500 pounds or to turn into the government for for uh, for iron. And whether the story was true or not, but many people believed it, and they turned their engines in. Lots of engines were in perfect condition; it was scrapped. With the demise of steam threshing, the equipment went out of production and sat derelict. When people realized that a tradition was passing from memory, some began to rebuild. Across the prairies, old separators still adorn the corner rock piles of many farms, but few are in working order. There's a lot of them around, but a lot of them are in pretty bad shape. Like the woods usually, they've sat outside so long, the wood, and wood is rotten out of them. Same with a lot of these old binders. There's lots of them around, but very few of them would do any harvesting. Oh, now she's turning. Okay. There you go. Okay. 
Okay. We got timbers. Huh? Jack all jack. You can get her down so she can't down. Put yeah. the timber in and get on, on the, the big one, you mean? Yeah. On the jack all jack. On the big one? Yeah. Well, I can do that. I you know, can I think it. that needs a little bit more, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it could so. stand a bit more. Yeah. yeah. And by these, we got the tools. We can soon give her more. You guys say when? Pull that off now, Wes. Eh? Pull her off now. That pretty yeah. hard. Well, you guys go ahead and try, and I'll go up the buildings and get a timber in the jack hole. <coughs> Couple of chunks you to put in there. have to make it down the jack hole. Oh, shoot, yeah. I've got timber. Yeah, yeah, right, we cut off the end of that <coughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. Something to uh, put under the jack hole, too. Oh, yeah. well, you can go and find another old one the same make and hope the part's in good shape. And <laughs> well, the wood, you, you have to make it. We put new wood in all these single trees and that, but they're... Uh, the the iron off the back of them is a good deal older than I am. Warren Best in town, he owns a separator and a steamer, and, and he looks after the maintenance on it, and I keep the horses and the wagons and the rest of the stuff going. We kind of have a community thrash. <laughs> it seems like a lot of the older fellows are kind of interested, so if they have something that they're not using, they'll, they'll generally give it to you. Because they're not ever going to use it, and they kind of seem to be kind of glad to see it be used again or do some good. So and there's quite a few young people interested in it. Yeah, there's just more than you'd think. Like I'm going to be able to find two or three guys to drive stoop teams this year, and they're they're all under 30. Just a bunch of us kind of like it, and I have horses, and I like it, and I like the horses, and so we kind of keep it up. And, we, we try and do it every fall because we get all this stuff all fixed up and we figure that if we quit, the, the stuff goes to pieces and, and you know, you don't ever get it back again. Yeah, you, you got to do some fixing every year. I think that these boys could, could keep it going if they, if they had the financial help and, and uh, the time. While Wes and others around Minnedosa struggle to keep wagons and separators in good repair, a different breed of thresherman has worked to preserve the steam boilers. Warren Best rebuilt this 1911 case tractor from the chassis up. Every year the old tractor goes back into action. First thing I did, I should have started at the beginning. First thing I did was to went to see Mr. Milney. He had four engines. He got them out of the bush somewhere. And I asked him, for you where there was another one where I could get one? And he assured me that there weren't any left, that they were all picked up by dealers like him. He said there wasn't any left. Well, I found 20. <laughs> Not whole ones by any means, but boilers and pieces. And there are many good reasons why people like Wes Ferguson and Frank May put so much time and money into saving the heritage of steam threshing. Even in the early days, it took a lot of highly technical knowledge to manage the equipment. Many of Manitoba's pioneers dedicated their lives to learning the trades that enabled the grain to move. There are many dangers inherent in steam power, and the equipment and the operators were inspected regularly. I had an uncle that took a course on steam. Back before World War I, there was quite a few boys down at Hall in the area that took it, young fellas, just to get them started. Their fathers bought outfits and they didn't run them. They had to hire men, so they thought they might as well send their own boys in for a course and get them started. And they were good engineers. I just had my father to go by and he was very careful and very particular. Uh, he wanted his engine washed out every week. Every, when they thrash all week, they'd take out the handholds on a Sunday and they'd to spend all week th uh, cleaning the mud out of it. They can realize that they accumulated stuff in the bottom of the boiler and that would be all washed out, new handholes put in. It wasn't very good for the thrasher. I mean, he, uh, he uh, had to work seven days a week. The days of the threshermen are relived more seldom as time goes on. Twenty years ago, the people who cared began to centralize equipment and know-how around the town of Austin. Now, the Manitoba Agricultural Museum thrives there. It boasts an impressive selection of the hardware required for threshing, and as in the old days, the operators and the machinery are inspected regularly to be sure that they meet the codes of the Steam Boiler Act.
Well, we watch that pretty close. We have some good operators here, but we still watch them. Even we know them, they're all good fellows, but we go around once in a while and just see what they're doing. Every July, thousands of people throng to Austin to relive the era of the steam threshermen. There are always younger operators trying to learn the idiosyncrasies of the equipment from those who still remember. The old timers will argue forever in favor of steam power. I don't know what it is. It's quiet power, it's the best, steadiest power you ever saw. I don't think electric power has even got a beat. What do you think? Oh, I agree. Eh? Yeah. No, it's, it's really steady power. Yep. And it's quiet power. Like, we can talk here. If that engine was running full throttle, we could talk here just the same as we are now. Couldn't we? Yeah. yeah. There's something sort of fascinating about taking that old dead thing and putting a fire in it and having it come alive. It actually comes alive. Thank you.